John chapter 15, we'll read verse number 8. We'll move on from there. This is red letters, so this is the words of Jesus. He says, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Let's pray. Lord, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you call us to be disciples. You don't just leave us on our own, God, but you call us to follow you, to walk with you, to learn of you, to learn from you, and be your disciple. Lord, we ask that you would help us to have a greater desire to be those disciples here today. In your name, Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Now, of course, we know a disciple is just a, a student or a learner or a pupil. And whenever we see the word in the Bible, and there's a few other references, but most every time we see it, it's referring to the followers of Jesus, the disciples. Now, to be a, a disciple of Christ basically means to be a student of Christ. It's a, a follower of Jesus, always learning from him, always learning of him, learning of his nature, walking with him. And, and this um, point in history, then uh, first century, uh, second temple Judaism, a Jewish person, uh, if a, a, a young man was called to be a disciple of a rabbi, he would, he would live with that rabbi. He would follow him everywhere he went. He would hang on his every word. They would work together. If the, if the rabbi had some medial task on his farm to do, the pupil or the disciple would be right there with him, working with him. Uh, there, there was even a saying that you know that the, 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 a good disciple would have the dust of his rabbi on him. He would be right with the rabbi. He would be close to it, watching him, learning him, wanting to learn how he dealt with situations, learn how he would act in certain transactions. He wanted to learn everything he could. And it wasn't just he learned Scripture. That was part of it. But he learned how Scripture was applied to life. There was a, a huge uh, emphasis put on discipline according to Scripture. And he learned all this from his rabbi. He learned all this as disciple. These disciples, when we see the 12 disciples, Jesus was their rabbi. That's why every time we see Jesus, they didn't have a certain time they met once a week and he get, had class. They were always with him. They were walking with him. Everywhere he was at, they were there. They left their life behind and they followed the rabbi. They were disciples. They followed him. They left the fishing nets. They left everything behind and they was wherever he was at. Amen. Now, we see this portion of scripture uh, Jesus is talking about um, glorifying the Father, and to glorify the Father, we must bear fruit. And to bear fruit, we must be disciples of Him. And so, you're going to, in order to do this, you must be my disciples. So, He's saying, in order to be able to bear fruit, or in order to be able to bear fruit, uh, uh, that we are going to have to be disciples of Christ. We're going to, have to be following Him, learning of Him. Um, watching his every move, seeing how he acts or reacts, watching his life. We must be disciples if we want to glorify the Father by being able to bear fruit. Now, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul makes this famous statement that he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Now, as disciples of Christ, this is a place where we learn a great deal about Christ is by suffering with Him, by travailing with Him, by taking on His burden and denying ourselves. Now, a first century Jew, they, they, they would have understood that in order to be a disciple of a rabbi meant total submission to that rabbi and a close, intimate walk with him day in, day out. It would have been a total submission. He would have done whatever the rabbi told him to do. Whatever work the rabbi put him to, he would have been willing to do that. He would have submitted to whatever the rabbi said. Now, in John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say to you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. 
Now our text read, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Now we see this disciple. He is a person who is submitted to the rabbi, submitted to the master. He's walking with him. He's learning of him. He has the dust of his rabbi on his clothes. He wants to be close to it and, and hang on his every word. And Jesus said, now if we want to bear fruit, if we want fruit being born in our lives, then this is the attitude that we have to have as disciples for our master. If we want to be those fruit-bearing uh, 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 children, those fruit-bearing subjects of God, if we want to be, uh, rep there want to be something coming out that gives evidence to the reality of God, God from our lives, then it, this isn't something that we can do uh, on our own, it, only as we stick close to the master, only as we have this uh, master uh, uh, disciple relationship with Christ will we be able to bear this fruit. He's like, you want to glorify God? You want to do something that counts for God? You want to be a blessing and a witness and a representation of God? To be my disciple. Follow me. Listen to me. Do what I say. Learn from me. We want to be, bring glory to the Father. We need to be learning about Christ. We need to be a disciple, a real disciple. Not just somebody that knows about it, but like a first century disciple who would have lived, eat, breathe, drink, and, and, and slept with the Master. Everything. They would have went and they would have stayed in his home. If they were unlike Jesus and had a home. Now, the fruit we're to bear is something that comes not out of desire just to simply do good works or to do a good deed or live a good moral life or be a productive member of society. Now those are all good things and if we are, are bearing fruit that the Bible speaks of here then all these things will be happening. But as a byproduct and not the prime product. The, if, I'm bearing, if I'm following after the, the master then I, I will do good deeds. I will do good works. I, I will live a good moral life. I will be a productive member of the community that I'm in if I'm following my master. But those aren't the things that, that we learn are the, the main aspect of the fruit that we are to be bearing as disciples of Christ. If we're bearing fruit, if we're bearing fruit that the Bible speaks of, that, that this is the, the, this is just um, only comes this true fruit. Uh, uh, it only comes of the, the spirit that will be resurrected in our lives. When we've been born again, it's the characteristics or the nature <coughs> or the attributes <coughs> of Christ. Now, the scripture said that <coughs> only when the corn of wheat dies, falls into the ground, where it brings forth much fruit. Now, I mean, we know Jesus is making the analogy here. We take, you take a seed, you take one kernel of corn from a year of corn, you throw it in the ground, you plant it, it's going to grow up a whole stock of corn, it's going to hope. It'll bear a whole lot of ears. It's going to bear a whole lot of kernels. So he's saying that only when the corn of wheat falls and dies can it bear more fruit. Only as there's, only as the, this life that we live is given to Christ can he multiply his life through our life. And only when we come to the altar, lay everything on it. And, you know, sometimes when you say lay everything on the altar, we're, we often think of sin. Lay up and bring your sins. And get rid of those sins. Turn those sins over. But it's so much more than that. It's so much more than me just coming to the altar and confessing sin. When I come to the altar, I put on it my, my whole self. And, and, of course, those are the bad things, the things that we perceive as are the bad, but also the things that we perceive as the good things. Our hopes, our dreams, our desires, our, our identity, our own will is on the altar. All that is given to the master. We lay all that down on, on, on the, the altar. That's what we say, die to self. That's what dying to self is, is when everything, it's everything, whatever you want out of me, God. I had dreams for this, but no longer. My dream is to serve you. My dream is to dream your dream. That's the attitude that we have to come to Christ with. Not that I'm going to add into my dreams and he's going to make my dreams happen, but as I come and I lay all of that on the altar, everything, and I cry out, not my will, but thine be done. That's what we mean when we say we lay it on the altar. We die to self. We give everything to Christ. Whenever that disciple chose to follow that rabbi, whenever the rabbi called the disciple, the disciple left the old life behind. His identity was wrapped up in being a disciple of that master. That was everything now. That was his whole life. Anything less that we bring to the altar will be only wood, hay, and stubble. Be things that are of no value. Now, Jesus often spoke 
in, in parables, but on a few occasions he spoke very plainly. And in regard to the subject of discipleship, there's a good example of his bluntness in Luke chapter 14. And he gives, he gives a parable in with this, or some examples, I guess you could say, but he is very clear on what it means to be a disciple. He wanted no mistake to be made on what it meant to follow him. You know, and Jesus, he never begged anybody to follow. He never made it any easier to follow. He never made it, it you know, it, all you do is say this, do that, and you're in. Don't worry about it. No, he, he, he put the cost out front. He said, this, this, is, this is going to be a major cost to you in your life if you want to follow me. It's going to mess your life up if you want to follow me. It's not going to be your life anymore. It's going to turn everything upside down if you choose to follow me. Uh, the, one of the first examples that comes to my mind, of course, is a rich young ruler. He comes to the Lord thinking that he's got everything that the Lord wants, and the Lord tells him, go sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, then follow me. The Bible says that the young man left sorrowful. Now, Jesus, it would have been natural and in most settings for someone to, to run him down. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't, be, don't run away so quickly. Let's talk about this. Let's make it easier. Let's see how we can figure it out. What can I do to help you or make you want to stay here and join my church? What do you need? But Jesus, it says he didn't run him down. He didn't say another word to him, but it says he beheld him and he loved him and he let him go. The young man counted the cost and he seen that the cost was more than he wanted to give to follow Jesus. Now, there's people that I know that are counting the cost right now. And it's, it's tempting for me to try to make it as easy and cost as less as I could to them. Tell them, all you got to do is this. Don't worry about none of that. Just say this. Go here. It'll all be wrapped up. It'll all be easy. But that would be a misrepresentation of what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Here in Luke chapter 14, starting verse 25. It says, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and his sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? whether he hath sufficient to finish it. Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, and all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador to desire uh, conditions of peace. So likewise... Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Jesus wanted no mistake to be made. He's like, I'm not going to make this sound easier so that you follow you want to follow me for a little while and then you say it's too hard and I want to go back. No man starts to build that foundation unless he knows he's ready to make the, the investment. No man's going to lay the foundation unless he's ready to pay the cost to build the house. He said, like, no man needs to come into this thing without knowing up front what it means to be a disciple of me. He said, I'm not going to, no man needs to know, so I'm going to put it out front. You've got to love me more than mother, father, husband, wife, children, and your own self also. This is what it means. He's like, he's put it out front. He's not, he, he, he's not making an appeal for these people to come and, and, and just, just uh, choose Jesus. But he's saying, this is going to cost you everything. I've got to be everything. I've got to be above everything. I've got to mean more than everything. You've got to choose me over everything if you want to be not my disciple. I'm not going to let you start laying a foundation for something that you're not ready to commit to. And I've heard so many appeals that Brother Cliff didn't say it was just like Walmart. If they didn't take bite it the first time, they'd roll back the price. Okay, you don't want Jesus at this price? We'll make him a little cheaper for you. And we misrepresent to people what it means to be a disciple of Christ. He says, so likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot me be my disciple. No mistakes. Now, he passes that mandate on to us. He tells us what it means to be a disciple. 
and what it costs to be a disciple. That it's an everything. You know, it's not part way. We can't be part time disciples. We can't be 85%, 95% disciples. We have to make a, being a disciple of Christ our whole life. That must be what our life is wrapped up in. That must be the chief aspect of our lives is serving God. More than anything else, more than making money, more than being uh, 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 well-known, more than being good at something, more than anything else, it must be wrapped up in serving Christ. And like I said, he passes the mandate on to us. He says, this is what it is. I want you to tell other people what it is. And Matthew 28, 19 says, go ye therefore and teach. Now most translations have to teach as translated as make disciples. Go ye therefore, making disciples in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. Now, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Now, he says, don't just go making converts. Don't just go and get people to make decisions for Christ, in a sense. And that's, that's a place where modern missions have failed. And um, that was one of the things that Brother Clint didn't notice that, that, that um, inspired him with the school of Christ. He said you could go to a, a place in Africa, you could have a crusade, thousands of people would come to the crusade to see the white man preach, and he said you could go back in five years to the same place and there wouldn't be two or three people who served God. And then uh, just, you know, very, just kind of blindly going through, adding superstition and everything. He said because there was no one there making disciples. He said, we went, and all we wanted was a number to make a convert so we could go back and express and brag about what, how much successful our, our crusade was, and no one's making disciples. Jesus says, commands us to make disciples, to show people, to educate them on what it means to be a disciple, a follower, what it means to forsake all things and make Christ the central focus point of our lives. That's what making disciples, that's what Jesus tells us to do. He said, go make disciples, go tell them what this means, go show them who I am and what it's going to cost for them to follow me, to be a part of me, to be born into this kingdom and to walk and to live therein. He said, go and represent me purely and make disciples. Amen. Now, religion today in Christianity in, in a nominal sense is more popular now than ever. Um, a lot of you probably this morning, I know I did, and got up and got on Facebook and scrolled through and seen a bunch of church people that I knew who had been to the Hank Jr. concert. <laughs> bunch of church people I knew have been so happy and smiling. I even seen one person I know with a picture with Hank. Now, a lot of these people will probably go to the late service at their churches today. So they don't feel like getting up and going to the early service because it was at the Hank concert all night. That's not real discipleship. That's not someone who is forsaking all to follow him. That's not people who are loving him above everything else, including themselves. <coughs> Now we can rational, or we can reason anything right if we want to. We can find a way in. We can find a way to wiggle through and say there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. But we're not we're not called to just try to figure out where we can wiggle through at. We're not. That, that's not the life of, of Christ that's been resurrected in us. That's not the fruit of the Spirit that be, to be born in our life. That's not the fruit that Jesus was talking about. If you're my disciple, you're going to be bearing this fruit that brings glory to my Father. It's going to be a person who is wrapped up in serving God. It's going to be a person who their life is wrapped up in Christ, in, in Him. And it, they're not looking for what ways they can wiggle through and what ways they can find something out to be right, but they're looking for ways that they can please God and trying to find ways that they can shun being a misrepresentation or bringing anything other than glory to His name. That's nominal Christianity. 
That means Christianity in name only. That's what nominal means. It means name only. And Christianity, like I said, in the nominal sense is more popular now than ever. More popular now than ever. You, you'll see celebrities that live the uh, lives of the devil that will say they're Christians. Now, these folks usually love to quote the promises of the Bible to talk about the things they can get out of God, but they hate the cross. The cross will always be the dividing point. The cross will always weed out the wheat from the chaff. Amen. Every time. The way when the cross is presented, when the cross is preached, when the cross is shown in all of its horrific glory, it will always separate the sheep and the goats. Amen. The goat ain't going to embrace the cross. Only the sheep. Only the weak, only the true one who loves Christ and loves what it means to follow him, one loves what it takes to know him. Like Paul, all oh, that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering the, and, 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 and the, the glory of his resurrection. Now, on that, that one, that is going to be where the cross is going to set the dividing line. And we, as though as disciples who are called to make disciples, are called to present the cross to the world. They hate the cross. Nominal Christianity hates the cross. But Jesus said that in order to be his disciples, we must take up our cross and follow him. And if we bear our cross as Christ has commanded, and that we, we will present the cross to those around us as being those disciples that he's called us to be, by, and we do this by living the crucified life. Not just talking to people about the cross, but we represent the cross with our lives. We live the life of the crucified. We live the life of the cross, denying self and serving God. We can't, we, we, we can't show the cross whenever we're self-serving, self-focused, self-absorbed individuals who only think of ways that we can find that we can serve ourselves and, and not be committing a sin at the same time. The one who is embracing the cross, the, cro the, the, the disciple of Christ, will be presenting the cross in their life by the way that they live. By the way we live, we show the cross. By the way we live, we show that the one who follows Christ bears the cross, lives the cross, is crucified under Christ, and lives in a way that represents Him, lives in a way that gives evidence to the changed life, to the crucified life, to the life who embraces the altar and has put everything on that thing. A life that shows that Jesus is worth it. Amen. Amen. If you know Christ, if you love Christ, if you've seen Him and you've prayed through and been introduced and by the resurrection of the life within us, we see and we know that He is worth the embrace of the cross. And we show this when we live the cross. We show that He means more to us. He's more to me than fire insurance, as we put it sometimes. He's more to me than just um, uh, uh, a, a ticket out. He's more to me than just something to, to make me feel good about myself, something to add to my life, but He is my life. And that's the embrace of the cross. It shows that. It proves that. It's evidence of that. It's evidence of someone who sees him as being the ultimate. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus says this. And this is one of those things that, that, that stick out as odd. You know, Jesus says some stuff that's just, that, that, that we hit it like a speed bump. We have to stop for a second. Like, what are you talking about? What's this mean? In, in chapter 10 of Matthew, verse 34, he says this. He says, Think not that I have come to send peace on earth. I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and, his, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Now when we think of Jesus, we think of peace, we think of tranquility, we think of comfort, we think of healing, we think of all those things. But it's Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So he is. But then he says this. He's like, don't think that I came to bring peace. You missed it. He's like, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Now, the scripture here says that he came to bring a confrontation that would be incredibly divisive. He came to bring a confrontation. Now, just like then, now, people don't like Jesus. They don't like the real Jesus. They don't like the cross 
bearing Jesus. They don't like the blood Jesus. They don't like the condemning of sin Jesus. They don't like that Jesus. They like the peace Jesus. They like the good time Jesus. They like the Jesus who's going to do something for them. The Jesus that wants to make them feel good about themselves. The Jesus who's going to affirm their lifestyle. That's the Jesus that most people like. But the cross Jesus is the one that most people hate. Now when we are, 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 are actually filled with Christ and we are living the life of the cross, those people who don't like that Jesus, who want the nominal Jesus, Jesus, those people, they're not going to like it. There's going to be a division there. There's going to be a, a, a warfare there in a sense. We're going to run up on a, a, a opposition as we bear the cross of Christ, as we represent this Christ, as we uh, put Him out there, as we present Him to this world and His cross, there's going to be opposition. There's going to be people who don't like it. There's going to be people who are going to want to fight against us because of that. And Jesus said, I'm going to cause a lot of division. I'm going to cause some fights. I'm going to cause some hardship. I'm going to cause a confrontation. Because when we live the life of the cross, when we're, we live that life, and we're thrown out there into the world, you see, that life is completely contrary to this world. That life of Christ, the life of Jesus, the true life, the cross-bearing life, is completely contrary to this world. This world, the religious Jesus, he'll fit right in. The religious Jesus will fit right in. He'll go with the flow and he won't make anybody mad. You know, everybody will like him. Everybody will want to get along with him. He'll, he'll go to the hand concert with you. He's a good guy. But the cross Jesus stands in opposition to all that. He says, I'm going to bring division. I'm going to bring hardship. I'm going to bring fights. I'm going to bring something that causes confrontation because they don't want me. They never have. Amen. If Paul had waited to find somewhere that wanted the gospel before he went to preach it, he never would have left Jerusalem. He would have stayed right there. He would have stayed on the road to Damascus. He never would have made it to anywhere else if he waited for someone to say, we want you to come. He went many places where they did not want him. They ran him out of town. They stoned him, left him for dead because they didn't want to hear what he had to say. That's the nature of this thing. That's the nature of Christianity. It's, 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 it's confrontational. It goes where it's not wanted. It goes to the places where it's not welcome. It goes to the places where it's not invited. It goes to those places and it takes a sword and it causes a confrontation. That's why so many people have died taking the gospel to places that, that, that it wasn't wanted, places that it wasn't at. And it's still, just because there's a lot of churches here, there's still people's hearts who do not want the true gospel, and they don't want to see it in you. It's going to be confrontation. Now, because of this, because of this being the nature of it, in many ways, we've become masters of compromise. We're afraid to offend someone by denouncing their lifestyle of sin. And, that, and, and, and by doing this, we lead people to believe that they can not repent, keep their sin, and still be a Christian. And this is all because we fail as good disciples to present the cross of Christ. We've made the cross a beautiful thing, a thing of, uh, of, uh, that represents good times and prosperity. We've made the cross into that. We've, we've, made, we've made it something that, that is that applies or appeals to my selfishness. We've made it into that. Now the cross is rejection. It's ostracism. The cross is death to everything that we are outside of Christ. And if we'll bear the reproach that comes with taking up the cross and following Christ, the world may hate us, and they may write us off as being crazy, but they'll know that they cannot have Christ, cannot have the true Christ, the life-changing Christ, and hang on to the world at the same time. There has to be a decision made. There's got to be a breaking that takes place. There must be division that happens in that moment. There, if I want Jesus, if I want the real Jesus that I see the people who bear the cross have, if I want that Jesus, then I've got to turn away from what the world is. I've got to make a break from that thing. I've got to turn away. I've got to leave all this behind. I've got to embrace 
the cross myself if I want that Jesus. The life-bearing, changing Jesus. The Jesus who takes away sin. The Jesus that brings true peace of mind. The Jesus who died for me. The Jesus who will take me to heaven. If I want that Jesus, I've got to embrace the cross, this confrontation, this is what we are to bring. This is what we are to create in our lives around the people that we, that we deal with. We are to plant the cross of Christ in the paths of everyone that we know. Not just by talking about it, by living it in front of them. There's a cost to discipleship. There's a cost to it. And this is it. This is the cost. It's going to cost us everything to follow Christ. It's going to cost everything that I am to follow Christ. It will be, uh, uh, the life of, of a Christian will be the life of the cross. Amen. Amen. Now, Mark chapter 14 and 50, I always thought this was a very interesting scripture. It's very short. It takes place um, on night of Jesus' arrest. They're in the garden. And all of the disciples had, had they'd been with Jesus through thick and thin. They'd been with him when everyone else had forsaken him. They, the, the, they had they heard every sermon. They'd seen every, uh, every miracle. They'd made bold proclamations that they would never leave him. They were ready to fight. They were drawn swords. And then Mark 14 and 50, it says, And they all forsook him and fled. Now you think, after all they've been through, after all they've seen, after all they've experienced, uh, that, that they would, they'd be ready. They'd be ready to do whatever. They'd be ready to face whatever was coming. You know, and, and of course, we always reference the, 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 the failure of Peter. But at that moment that the soldiers come to arrest Jesus, he was the one who pulled his sword. He's ready to fight. He's ready to go down. He's ready to do whatever he has to do at that moment. Until the cross came on the horizon. The cross showed up. Then Jesus was going to the cross. He's going to the cross now. He, he's letting go. He's giving up. He's, he, he's going willfully. He's going to the cross. And they all forsook him and fled. They all turned. They all left. They all turned on in that moment whenever the cross came up. Now, every day in our lives, we are faced with the cross. We're faced with those moments. We're faced with those times when we're going to obey Christ or we're going to forsake Christ. We're going to go, or we're going to embrace the cross, deny ourselves, obey His word, or we're going to forsake Him and flee in, in light of the cross. Every day, all the time, you're going to face that. There's going to be things that you're going to face. I'm going to say tomorrow, there's going to be things that you'll probably face today before we come back to service tonight, where you have to make a choice whether to embrace the cross of Christ or forsake Him and flee. Amen. We have those choices forced on us all day long. And when we embrace the cross, when we embrace the cross, it's a lie. It's a witness. It's evidence that Jesus means something. It's evidence that he's something important. He's something special. He's someone powerful to have that effect, to have that influence on a human's life, that they're willing to embrace the cross, deny itself in order to serve and obey and please him. It's a lie. It's a testimony of his reality and truth. In this world, every time that we choose the cross over ourselves, and people see it, people know it, it makes a difference. It shows something. A.W. Tozer said this, one of my favorite cross quotes. He says, you knew one thing about a man who was carrying a cross outside of the city. You knew that he wasn't coming back. He wasn't coming back. Whenever we embrace that cross, whenever we carry the cross in this world, whenever we obey Christ, we follow him, when we, we take up our cross, and we're walking with him, we show to everyone who sees us that there's something worth going all the way for. There's something different. There's something that means something. We're going all the way. There's nothing for me to go back to. There's nothing to go back. Whenever we're having those thoughts, those temptations of going back, whenever the world starts to look good again, we have, we, we, we have, we've lost sight and focus of Christ and laid our cross aside and we're looking to go back out into this world. But as we see Him, we keep our focus on Christ. If we are enamored with the Master and I desire to be that disciple that bears good fruit, I will embrace the cross in order that I can follow Him and represent Him and be with Him and bring honor 
honor and glory to His name. It will be worth it to bear the cross in front of all those and let them know and let them see, be a testimony, evidence in this world that Christ is worthy. It costs everything to carry the cross then, as Tozer was making the point. And if we'll carry the cross today that Christ has presented to us, it'll cost us everything in a sense as well. Now the things that it costs, sometimes sometimes it, it hurts in the beginning. Sometimes it, 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 it is um, uh, hurtful or, or painful to deny ourselves certain things. But what we gain in carrying the cross, what it leads us to, will never, ever be worthless or worth less than what we give up for. There's a great misconception in regard to how uh, the cross relates to Christianity today. A lot of people, what we're talking about in regard to the cross isn't what they think of whenever you talk about the cross. You mention the cross, this isn't where their mind goes. So what we're talking about, how the cross applies to me, me carrying the cross, me being a disciple of Christ, and being a disciple of Christ means bearing the cross of Christ. A lot of people, uh, th this, is a, um, this is what they think of. This is the general consensus or understanding of what the cross is. People say, didn't Jesus die on the cross? And wasn't it there that the victory was won? And from there, Jesus says it is finished. And we now look back to the cross as the reference point for where redemption took place. And although we should never forget the cross, how does it apply to us other than being the historic place where the sacrifice of the Lord was made? That's the general attitude toward the cross. I've heard many messages preached that this was the aspect of the cross. This is it. This was as far as it went. We should never forget the cross. And that's where Jesus died. And that's where the blood was shed. And that's where the price was paid. And that's where it was finished. And that's the cross. And we hear that. And we take the cross. And we leave it in history. And we say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done on the cross. And never think twice about taking up a cross ourselves. That cross doesn't apply to me. This cross is in, is in the past. This is a historic cross. We, it, it's there. It does, it's, not what, it's not the cross that I've been given. It's not the cross that the Bible says I'm to bear. This was the cross of Christ. This is not this is the, the cross. That cross is done. It's over with. It's in the past. The cross that I'm called to bear is different. That's the cross we're talking about. The cross that we're given. The cross that Paul said is the power of the gospel. Amen. It's the cross that's been laid on us. And Jesus, he lived the cross long before he was ever physically nailed to the cross. He was always submissive to the will of the Father. He was always choosing the Father's will. And the cross has been given to us that through the embrace of the cross, the self-love can be crucified and we can walk in the will of God. That's the, the cross is inseparable from the true disciple. The true disciple of Christ cannot walk with Christ without bearing the cross that he's given us. Amen. And I've, I've heard it made or explained like this, and I've used the same type of explanation. But if you've got a job to do, the tool that you need to do that job is very important. If we had to dig a ditch out of here and we didn't have a shovel, that would make that job much more difficult, almost impossible. We didn't have the tools to do it with. Now, there's nothing glorious about the shovel. It's going to cause a lot of discomfort. It's going to cost some skin. There's nothing going to be fun about the shovel. But if you got a job, if you want to accomplish something, there's nothing more precious than the shovel if you have to get the ditch done. And the, the cross, in a sense, in this aspect, it's, it's given to us to accomplish something in our lives. The cross is, is, is a horrific thing. It was to Christ when he was nailed to the thing. It is to this flesh whenever it's presented to us. It's a horrific thing. It represents death. And that's it. It's the electric chair of the time. That's all it represents. It's a method of death. And the Lord has called us and given us the cross. He's at bear this cross. Put that old thing to, to death. Put that old flesh to death. 
put that flesh in the place where it needs to be. Nail it on that cross so that the fruit of the Spirit can live through you. So the, that thing that, the, the main thing that wants to hinder the will of God in your life, the main thing that wants to stifle the representation and our witness in this world is the flesh. He says, nail it to the cross. Nail it to the cross. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Put it on the cross. Put it on this thing to kill it. Every time, Brother Clinton used to say, when you walk into the, the church and you see the altar, it says one thing to you, you deserve to die. Every time we walk into the house of God, we see the altar. We see the altar. The, the, the same, it's convertible with the cross. We see the altar. It says die. Every time. That's all it means. That's what it represents. It's not a place that represents good times and ease and prosperity. It's a place that says come and die. It's that Christ may live in you. That is the purpose of the cross. That we may die. That he may live. And I, if I bear that cross out in this world, that's going to be a witness. There's going to be a witness of the life of Christ that comes radiating out of the Christian as we bear the cross in this world. It's not just uh, resisting the desires of the flesh. It's choosing His will over our own will. It's acting, it's acting dependently on Christ and not independently of Christ. That is the life of the cross. Discipleship is making ourselves totally, totally available to God regardless of what the cost may be. That's discipleship. We walk with Him. Whatever He wants out of us. Whatever that rabbi demanded of that disciple, He done it. He said, he said okay, the lesson today is going to be picking beans. That's, and they, he didn't protest. He said, I didn't come here to pick beans. I came here to learn theology. He said, no, the lesson today is pick beans. And that's what the disciple would have done. And that's the attitude that we approach Christ with. We take up the cross. It's not my will, it's yours. This will has to die. These desires have to die. And the, everything must be wrapped up in Christ. Amen. Paul says this. I'll close with this if they want to give us a song. And I think that this just sums up the whole thing. What it means to bear the cross, to live the crucified life, and what the crucified life is to be. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, he says... For him to say that the life that you see is not me, it's Christ, tells us that this is a holy life that Paul's living. This is a life that represents the nature and the characteristics of God. This is a life that's bearing the fruit of the Spirit. For him to say, this life that you see me live, this isn't me. This is the Holy Spirit living through me. This is the life of Christ. He says, I've crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm crucified. That means all my will, ambition, desires, my everything is dead. I've laid that aside. Now my life is wrapped up in Jesus. Everything about the apostle's life from that, from, from the time of his conversion to the time of his death was all wrapped up in Christ. Everything. His whole life was wrapped up in Jesus. He says, I'm crucified. I'm crucified. <laughs> Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The man you see me live in, this isn't Paul, Saul of Tarsus. This is a man who's been bought by the blood of Christ, who's been crucified with Christ, and the life of Christ can now live through. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I live now <coughs> in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Amen. This is, this is the life of the disciple. This is what it means to be a disciple of God. This is what it means to follow Him. This is what it means to be a Christian. Amen. Amen. This is what we must desire. This is what we must endeavor to be is disciples, not just Christians, not just church people. We've, we've got enough church people. That's true. We've got enough nominal Christian church people. We need disciples. If we want to be make an impact, if we want to represent Christ, if we want to touch other people's lives in this world, if, if, if we want to give them a a pure representation of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be saved, what it means to follow Christ, what it means to be on our way to heaven. 
we need to be disciples. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together and we'll open the altar. Amen. Lord, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your grace, <coughs> your mercy, your kindness, Lord, your patience. Lord, we thank you that you call us to be disciples. Lord, you just don't set us upon our own way, but you call us to walk in a way that we can know you, that we can live close to you, that we can represent you. Lord Jesus, you give us the means that we need to be those representations in this world. We thank you, Lord. We ask, God, that you would encourage us this morning to be disciples, that you would stir us, God, deal with our hearts. God, give us a revelation of the value it is of you and of following you and representing you, Lord. Help us, God, to be uh, uh, just enamored with you and the greatness. That we, nothing that we have to lay aside, nothing that we have to put on the altar, nothing that we lay on the cross seems too valuable in the light of the revelation of the greatness of Christ, God. I ask, Lord, that you give us this revelation today in a greater way than ever before. In your holy name, Jesus, we ask this. Amen. Let's all come and pray. Let God deal with you. Let God encourage you this morning. Let God reveal himself to you.
thing is Christ. So we can't do that on our own. I can't conform myself to Christ. No matter how hard I try, I can't do it. But I can conform myself to the altar. I can get up and I can make an appointment and I can come to an altar. And that's, you know, figuratively speaking, of course, you may be going to the altar in time of prayer or home or whatever, but we have, we make the altar the central point of our life, the place where we come and give ourselves to the Lord. He said, now, if we can form ourselves to the altar, by coming to the altar and seeking God, seeking God to deal with us, seeking God to make me a disciple or a great degree, if I can form myself to the altar while I do that, he can form me to the room of Christ. As I come to the altar and I spend time there letting him deal with me, he's doing the work in me where the, the character